Welcome back, everybody. Good to see uh, still a nice uh, full, full hall. And uh, I hope everyone's had a, a really good lunch as uh, we digest all the uh, thoughts from the, the morning sessions. Now, as you can see, the, the, the title of our uh, session you know, this afternoon is uh, Forgotten Conflicts, Open Wounds. And uh, I just want to start by telling a little story about my own experience of covering conflicts which have now fallen into this category. I first came to Georgia in 2008 to cover, in August 2008, to cover the, the war here when uh, Russia uh, invaded Georgia, almost uh, got all the way to the capital where we are now. Um, the war, of course, was, was fairly short. Um, but everyone who was here at that time, even then, they were saying that this was effectively the prequel, that Ukraine, Crimea was next. And you can look it up, those predictions were being made. But very quickly, it got forgotten. And I think one of the things that is striking even now, when of course we've had first of all Crimea in two, 2014, and then now the full invasion of the country uh, this year, it's surprising how little uh, the story of Georgia, in two, of, the, of the war in 2008, how, how rarely that gets told and how rarely that kind of that lesson um, is, is, is looked back on. Now, I, I then, um, I'd spent a lot of my time at that point covering Iraq. I'd been basically between Iraq and Afghanistan ever since the 9-11 attacks. Um, and Iraq, of course, became the big, the big story uh, with American involvement, uh, pushing aside Afghanistan for quite a long time. Roll forward many, many years on after uh, ISIS took over large parts of the country for a while, all the way forward to 2020. I was back in Iraq then. And the reason I had gone back was, you may or may not remember, there were huge protests at that time. And really the issue that was at the heart of it was a new, young, post-2003 uh, invasion generation of Iraqis wanting their rights. They wanted democracy. Um, and it ended up in a bloodbath. Over the, over the several months that the, the protests were going on, some 600 uh, people were, died, uh, were, were killed, most of, them, most of them young Iraqis. But what was striking when I was in Baghdad in, in early 2020, not long just before the pandemic kind of kicked in, was just how little coverage this was getting. At the same time, the, Hong Kong, the protests in Hong Kong were underway, and I think uh, maybe one or two people were killed in those protests. That was getting so much more coverage. And yet, here was um, a new generation of Iraqis fighting for their rights, but the rest of the world, it seemed, really no, no longer cared. And it, of course, the key difference was that somehow it seemed there were no longer any super, superpower stakes. The Americans were no longer involved in the same way. And so this story kind of got, got got lost. And now, all the way forward to today, and obviously linking to, uh, to Saad's experience, and we'll be talking about this in more, more detail, uh, we have what's happened in Afghanistan. And it was obviously the biggest news uh, of the moment in August last year, when the Americans pulled out and then the Taliban uh, took over. Now, it's all forgotten. And we want to today to look at all those lessons that have come out of this. And it seems to me that in terms of what we've been talking about today and generally, when we talk about forgotten wars, uh, it's not just the fact that they're not lo no longer getting any coverage. It's not just the open wounds that they're not solved. It's the open wounds in terms of how they're perceived and the fact that those, those arguments are still uh, not resolved. Do you think, Saad, uh, the problem is, is that we are, to some extent, kind of a slave uh, to the, the mindsets of the, the current obsession of the superpowers and the way that we deal with conflicts? 
I think you just need to switch it, switch it on there, yeah. Yes? Okay, That's great. It. It's wonderful to be here, and thank you again for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> well, I think any, if, if Western policy doesn't deal with a particular conflict, it's forgotten. All right, so today we have two issues. We have the issue of, of, of coverage and perception, and the issue of, uh, and more importantly, of action. Uh, what we're seeing now today is, you know, huge conflicts, not, not just being forgotten, but being neglected completely. Afghanistan being a case in point, the Middle East, where the Americans have uh, seemed to have completely pulled out, uh, conflicts in Africa, which we were talking about last night. Um, and and, and the, this is a major issue, and the, the, the Americans, it seems, and Western nations have focused on uh, great power competition and less so on, on, on the sort of micro-conflicts. You know, war on terror, which was such a huge thing for two decades, is all of a sudden not an issue at all. You know, ISIS exists, Al-Qaeda exists, and various other groups exist, but they think they can manage them, and they're willing to live with it. But it's about China, and more recently about Russia. And I think this is, you know, and, and, and it's for, for people like us who are active in some of these conflict zones, um, you know, when we go to Washington and, you know, trying to get people's attention, they just don't seem to have the bandwidth. But is it not also the case that um, if, to follow your line of argument, that if America was to step away uh, and then not be involved in the Ukraine conflict, um, to simplify it, if, if uh, Ukraine uh, if Russia stops fighting, the war is over. If Ukraine stops fighting, Ukraine is over. Doesn't there have to be um, some American involvement to preserve uh, what the, the ideals that, that Ukraine now symbolizes? Yeah, but <clears throat> okay, the question I asked last night with some of my friends who are experts and have been in the region for a long time, in and out of Ukraine, or in and out of Ukraine, is this, is, is, it has to be the single most important question, how will this end, All right? Um, now, many of you probably don't remember, but uh, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in 19, December of 1979. Uh, there was a Soviet-backed coup in April of 78, and 44 years on, we're still in conflict. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, I have to point out that a lot of Afghans suffered, including my own family. And just to give you some stats, the population of Afghanistan in 1975 was estimated at 12 million. The decade that followed the Russian invasion, we lost 1 million individuals, 1 million Afghans were handicapped, and 7.5 seven, seven million Afghans were forced to flee their country. We, we paid a very heavy price for what eventually uh, became apparent was a Western victory over the Soviet Empire. Looking back, the Americans are content, or the Western nations are content, with their backers and allies in the Middle East, to fight to the last Afghan. But what happened to Afghanistan after 1989 when the Soviets pulled out? It was completely neglected up until 2001, and it's neg neglected again. So the question I ask you know, a lot of, from a lot of my Ukrainian friends and people who support them, how will this end? Your nation is entirely reliant on Western support, military and otherwise. Um, and the Amer American politics is pretty unpredictable now. What's gonna happen in two years' time uh, uh, during the presidential elections? Um, how, you still have to be, you have, still have to live next to the Russians, you know, for, forever. Is there, a, is, is there a target? Is there something you would want to negotiate and when and how? Because, as, the, you know, as a paraphrasing Lord Palmerston, who said that there are no permanent friends and no permanent enemies, only permanent interests, is that the Americans, have, in particular, have been very fickle in their friendships, whether it was Afghanistan or Iran or now Saudi Arabia and so many other countries. Be prepared for the day when they lose interest. And there are no fairy tales in the real world. And I think it, 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 it's, it's easy to cheerlead from the sidelines but it, this involves people dying and people getting killed and destruction from both sides, of course. So I, I just caution about, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know we've, we've seen this play out in our own lives. It's been 44 years, for us at least. I think, um, it seems to me, when I'm thinking about 
this, this gathering, the kind of the theme, it brings to mind an old, uh, uh, the old uh, line from President Clinton uh, that it's the economy stupid. But I think we need to kind of update that and say, actually, it's the story stupid. Because, and that also applies, of course, to the economy. And isn't that, going back to what you're saying, Saad, the issue here is about what story we are telling about these past conflicts. And you mentioned you know, the Russians invading Afghanistan. That is the beginning of the never-ending war that Afghanistan has had to go through for the last 43 years. Um, it started there, and then other superpowers, of course, then have been, you know, the Americans then came in, they failed, and so on. But it started with instability that was caused um, by the Russians. But again, that doesn't get talked about. That bit of the story tends to get forgotten. And doesn't that, wasn't, can't that help us kind of understand uh, the way that we see other conflicts today? Yeah, I mean, we obviously don't learn um, or learn well enough because the Soviets are making the same mistake, uh, obviously. Um, and, and, you know, 1979 was, a, was an unusual year, and Yaroslav wrote this wonderful book called The Siege of the Mosque, dealing with, uh, with, with the siege of the mosque in Mecca, the Iranian Revolution, um, the peace deal between the Egyptians and the Israelis in 79, the Afghan conflict, it was a particularly bad year for everyone. And, and really, for the Middle East, things have not been the same. Uh, I tell people that in 1969, when I was three, I was born in London, my parents drove from continental Europe all the way to Kabul. Now, with the exception of Iran, maybe, I mean, Iran is not exactly peaceful today. You know, there's conflict all over the Middle East. Um, so. Forget the 40 years war. I mean, we're dealing with, you know, a five-decade dec conflict. And we don't learn enough, and we don't learn quickly enough uh, to be able to deal with these crises. Uh, and, you know, for the future, what can we learn from what's going on in Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis China, for example? Are the policymakers taking note? Are the Chinese studying this? I mean, I think there are lessons everywhere, past and present. Let's talk a little bit more about your experiences in Afghanistan, both both before the Taliban took over and since, um, Saad, I think it's fair to say, is you know your the the, the TV network Tolo that you uh, created in Afghanistan was really one of the vanguards in in transforming Afghanistan over the last 20 years, um, with the kinds of programming that you were putting on, um, in shaping and helping to shape a new Afghanistan. Now, that same TV channel is still going, but it's behind Taliban lines. Just, can you tell us about the kind of the challenges of, of, of keeping going now uh, under, this, under this new authoritarian religious regime? Well, it's very challenging. I mean, uh, someone described the, you know, the streets of Kabul when the Taliban took over, like something out of a scene where the aliens take over. They looked different, they acted differently, they behaved differently. Um, so it's a strange dance because, you know, we're, we're intent on continuing, but obviously we can't show soap operas, we can't have music on. Um, the women are now forced to cover their faces. So aspects of what we do is now um, produced and uh, distributed from outside in Turkey and Central Asia and so forth. But you know, we still have 500 people on the ground, and our presence is important because, as you as a reporter know, that you, you need to have people on the ground to report on things. It's not just the fighting or terrorist acts, it's about education. Um, you know, we have done something like three or 400 stories since March just on education in terms of the importance of education, amplifying the messages of the religious establishment and so forth to, to, con to, to um, convince the government that education for women is important, for example. So they still play an important role, but increasingly it's becoming difficult. Um, and that space is shrinking for us to be able to operate, uh, as, you know, I would still say independently. Um, we always have options, but um, can they change? You know, I, I, you know, the more they're in power, they could perhaps change but then again, you know, it's a, I think it's a 50-50 thing. I advocate engagement with the Taliban. Talking to them is more important than, you know, than not talking to them. There are pragmatic elements, not moderate, but pragmatic elements within the movement itself. 
uh, who understand they can't govern on their own. Um, but but I still, I'm not convinced. It's, I, I would still say it's a 50, I would say it's 55, 45, 45 being, you know, the group changing and moderating, moderating its ways and 55 for the, for the, uh, for, for, for the whole ex experiment to fail. I mean, some people have criticized you for keeping going um, because you've had to change the nature of the coverage that you're producing. What do you say to those people who are saying you can't still stand up for free media in a new Taliban-controlled Afghanistan? Well, it's a difficult, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm conflicted personally. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult decision. Uh, we think that it's better for us to be on the ground, to report on things, to inform and educate not just the people on the ground, but also to actually inform people outside in terms of what's transpiring in the country. But we're also using our platform for, you know, now we're trying to create education program for young men and women in the country using our sort of television uh, slots in the morning and the afternoon. So. There's, I can see benefits, and I, I can see also people saying, well, you've gone against, you know, you're not, you don't have your shows like the Idol format, or you don't have various other shows. And I think, bigger picture, I th still think we're doing the right thing, but I say this in mid-October 2022, I may have a different view in a week or two weeks' time. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, we, if um, we broaden out again, and, you know, from, Afghanistan to, to other, other lessons and then thinking about the, current, the, the Ukraine conflict now. Um, America uh, has been criticized. You're raising some of that for its support and not thinking about the kind of the long-term consequences. Um, but do you think that there is a danger that too often we end up viewing conflicts through the prism of what the superpowers are doing. So in other words, if America had chosen to stand back on Ukraine uh, and India had clearly taken Ukraine's side, wouldn't it be the case that everyone would then be dumping on the Americans for saying, well, why aren't you supporting you know, the democratic ideals of, uh, of, of Ukraine? Yeah, and, and the flip side is also important that a lot of people who are now not necessarily sympathetic to the Russian stance, uh, but they're critical of the American stance. And as a result, the poor Ukrainians are sort of the collateral damage. Uh, because uh, uh, someone pointed out before that there's a lot of hypocrisy uh, in politics, as we know. So I think, I think for the Americans, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. But the important lesson for us as Afghans is, is you know, how much we have to rely on ourselves. And I think the lesson for us, and it's important for us to look back over the last 20 years and to see what we can learn from, from the mistakes, the collective mistakes of the Americans, of the Afghans, of everyone, is that how we, can we become self-sufficient? And how can we create something that's indigenous? How can we engage the entire population, rural as well as urban, different ethnic minorities? How can we be more inclusive? And these are important lessons for us, you know, and I, I think too often people say, what, what are the Americans thinking? Who cares what the Americans are thinking? We should figure things there out. Is, there is an over kind of reliance at times, isn't there, still on the Americans? There's always the expectation that what are the Americans going to do? And I mean, even now, America is the biggest aid donor to, to Afghanistan. Um, I mean, everyone talked about China moving in, yeah. but actually America continues to be the biggest source of funds, even while they're yeah. sanctioning the country. I mean, you know, people talk about the rent, uh, rentier state or, you know, whatever state, uh, client state. We've, we've also been turned into a beggar state, forever begging. And you, you have people with a sense of entitlement, you know, what's the world going to do for us? So I think we have to culturally change that mindset if we can. Uh, Georgia, I see, is a very, it's very independent, it's, you know, it's its own country with a great history. Um, but a lot of other countries in the region, have also the sense of entitlement. You look at a country like Pakistan, which has been a failure from day one, totally reliant on international assistance, uh, and, um, and, and can, will continue to do so. Um, what do you think, though, uh, are some of those key lessons that, that can be learned that apply to you know, past conflicts, to forgotten conflicts? Um, I mean, I'm thinking one in particular is how we handle war crimes. Um, 
there was a, a lot of uh, response, a lot of outrage within Afghanistan um, when people first started talking about war crimes investigations in Ukraine because they said, well, you know, the Americans are not going to allow any war crimes investigations into their own uh, actions in Afghanistan. So don't go around um, talking about war crimes if you're not going to subject yourself to the, same, to the same standards. Is that kind of one of the areas where you think the Americans could actually do something differently that might change attitudes? But the Americans won't. Right. Uh, they have one set of rules for themselves and another set for the rest of the world. And I, I spoke to uh, uh, Mr. Khan, the, uh, the, uh, the chief prosecutor of the, uh, uh, of the ICC. Um, uh, you know, I mean, he, he didn't have an answer for that. I mean, they're indicting, they're attempting to indict people in Afghanistan, but they're not indicting the, the, the Americans. And bad things happen on both sides. So. I, I th no one's going to take these things seriously uh, uh, unless it's applied equally to everyone, to all sides. Do you think, though, that what is also happening is that people are, when it comes to the Ukraine conflict now, to some extent, and this is about the open wounds of the theme of our talk, is that they are still, to some extent, fighting in their minds the, the Iraq war. They're still... I mean, you constantly hear it about Ukraine. Uh, well, what about Iraq? And I mean, when I've had these kinds of conversations, I say to people, well, what about Iraq? I mean, sure, so Iraq, it was wrong to invade Iraq, but if you're clear that it was wrong to invade Iraq, then can't you also take a, a clear-cut position on uh, it being wrong for Russia to invade, uh, to invade Ukraine? How do you get round the the tendency of, I think, many people to view a current conflict uh, through the prism of the last one? Well, I, uh, it's a fair question, right, that uh, the Americans are cheerleading the Ukrainians, but they did the exact same thing um, in 2003. Um, it, it's a difficult one. I think uh, someone pointed out that the Ukrainians need to go out more and, 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 and talk about the conflict. But, you know, I was in, in Delhi a couple of weeks ago, and I, I was it last week, I met with some senior government officials, and their stance on, on the Ukraine is very interesting, in that what they say is, what could the Europeans have done to prevent the war, right? This bear poking is the reason why we have this war. It's about not enough effort was made. I think they're sympathetic to the cause of the Ukrainians. But, there's, but they're saying that this, this could have been, you know, that this may have been avoidable. So I think a lot of, when you get outside this bubble, as I think your talk was previously, you hear those sorts of things. I don't think people are necessarily unsympathetic to the Ukrainian cause, but they're asking the question, what could, what could have the world done to avoid this war? You know, but doesn't that inevitably end up um, giving succor, giving comfort to, to the Russian argument that, you know, we, we had to invade uh, because we were, we were under threat. Um, and it, it doesn't that end up letting, uh, letting the Russians off the hook. But also, more broadly, it then has implications for the way that we look at other conflicts as well. So if Russia's involved in a conflict, it has, there are different standards to the way, to, to, to those that are used for American involvement in a conflict. Well, I mean, you know, one interesting thing, which, which uh, I'm sure the experts may know more about, is the fact that the back-channel uh, communications between the Americans and the Soviets during the Cold War are virtually non-existent today. So if there's a sense of paranoia in the Kremlin, it's partially a reflection of people not being able to communicate effectively enough. And, of course, Putin was being told a bunch of lies by his intelligence and military people. I, I think that when we look back in 100 years' time, we, we would look at these sorts of things. So maybe there was a miscommunication. Maybe Putin was always convinced that he was going to do this and because no one said anything to him in Georgia and various other in Crimea. Uh, it was inevitable it was going to happen. And, you know, and to be honest with you, we don't, I, I don't know the answers to that. Um, but what I'm trying to convey, uh, you know, uh, because people always wonder why are people in India, why are people in Africa, why are people in parts of Europe and Latin America are suspicious of US involvement in Ukraine. And I'm just sort of echoing some of their questions, you know, how they challenge 
this, this, this war today. I mean, I remember lots of Afghan friends and also that same um, sentiment being echoed on Afghan social media when the war uh, started, or, and once it was clear that the Americans were really going to come in with serious, serious weaponry, Afghan friends were, were saying, well, you know, good luck, Ukrainians, you know, the Americans will stay with you for a while, and then, uh, and then they'll abandon you, and, um, and that is still uh, definitely a, a very strong current of feeling, isn't it, in, inside Afghanistan? It's important. You're, you're the most important country on the planet to the Americans until you're not, mm. right? And we've seen that. And I t tried to tell this to President Karzai, and I gave him a history of this small merchant bank in Australia that was bought by Citigroup, and then was sort of sold back to the local partners, then bought back four years later at a premium, then sold again, and then bought back three on three occasions. And I said, the Americans in will inevitably abandon this country and may come back, but they, they, they treat their foreign policy like they treat their businesses. They may come back and pay a premium, but they're not afraid of cutting their losses and walking away. And, you know, perhaps for the American but, bigger I picture, mean, there will be a deal on yeah, the table. I mean, sorry Russians. to interrupt you, but I have to push back, because, I mean, don't, you know, don't, don't all superpowers do that. I mean, you know, Russians, Russians are, hardly, uh, are hardly kind of kind and uh, cuddly it, to, it, their, to their kind of client states, are they? Absolutely. And if we were in the White House, we'd do the exact same thing. But what I'm saying is that's the reality. No one falls in love when it comes to foreign policy. Saad, you, you wear many hats. I mean, you, you've had, we've talked a little bit about Tolo, the, uh, the, you know, the, the TV network that you built up in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, but you also have businesses uh, elsewhere. Um, you operating from Dubai. You've been, in, you've been invested in Ethiopia. Um, and also, you sit on the board of the International Crisis Group. And you know, you're, you're well connected in many of these different places. Do you, do you feel that you are able, in the conversations that you have, to kind of reach across all these divides that we're talking about? Um, I mean, say, particularly in Washington, uh, are you trying to get this message out to say, look, you know, you've got to address uh, the, the question of hypocrisy, of double standards. Do you have any, any kind of success with that? Well, I mean, uh, you, you know, if, you have, if you get FaceTime with important people, you tend to focus on one or two things. And maybe it's just a, uh, because we're business people, we're much more practical people, so we focus on the, the, on the practical things. And, you know, I'm a one-issue guy, which is Afghanistan, and I care deeply about my country, and particularly now the women of the country and the minorities. And what's transpiring, this humanitarian crisis, it's impacting 98% of the population. I mean, really, this is, I cannot describe how bad the situation is uh, on the ground. Um, however, you know, there, there are opportunities to, to discuss these issues, but you know, you're dealing with human beings. I mean, they have, you know, if, if, if you're a Blinken or a Jake Sullivan or, or Lloyd Austin, you, you only have, you know, 60 hours a week. I mean, they work around the clock. You can't focus on everything, and that's why it's always shifting in terms of what's in, what's what's important to the to the administration, and it may very well change in two years' time. Do you, what more do you think they could do to the Americans, particularly, to reach out to the rest of the world? We've been talking about this a bit earlier in other sessions to try to um, explain why they're why they're doing this. What would what would have an impact? Well, it's very depressing. I mean, I, I, I was speaking to a European diplomat who was at the National Security Council meeting in, in, in New York discussing Afghanistan, and the bickering between the Russian ambassador and the American ambassador was something out of a kindergarten. You know, they, oh, what, you, what, you, what you did in the 80s and what you did in the you know, 2000s. It's, I wish it was more mature and it was more uh, uh, proactive. Um, and constructive, and unfortunately, sometimes, and you know, again, because we're dealing with human beings, you know, you don't have the level of sophistication we hope or expect from these senior officials. But obviously, in a place like Afghanistan, there are common issues, whether it's radicalism or drugs or refugees. For, you know, for most countries in, in Europe, yeah, you know, the Afghans. We've been the biggest contributors to European refugee problem for like 20 years now, every single year, with the exception of that one year, a lot of Syrians showed up and perhaps last year because of the Ukraine. So there are a lot of common um, 
common things for the, for, for the international community to discuss. But what we're seeing now in Afghanistan, I think the Russians and the, Ch and the, and the Chinese and the Central Asians and even the South Asian countries may come together because the Americans have left a vacuum in terms of dealing with Afghanistan. And you look at the Middle East, the Abraham Accords is, is also a sort of a byproduct of, of this, you know, this vacuum where, they, where these countries have thought, well, we've got to come together because we have Iran as a menace. Uh, we have to deal with our own issues. So you may see more of a regional approach on, on some of these issues, which is not necessarily a bad thing. The problem is that even today, U.S. interest is very important, and U.S. leadership is very important. Um, so, uh, but it uh, boils down to bandwidth, mm. which now is lacking, mm. certainly on Afghanistan. Mm. I'm thinking it might be a good point to um, open up uh, to questions a bit. Uh, and Saad, one, I think I'm just, also when you answer, can you just hold the microphone just a little closer to, oh. yeah, I think some of the, some of, some of what you're saying is not getting through. I can see a, a hand right at the back there. Uh, I can see, oh, there we go. Could someone get a microphone to Chogo at the back there? I can see, there you go. You can, you, you can, you can go for it if you're... Uh, thank you very much for this interesting conversation. Can you identify yourself? Please? I'm Tamara Chergoleshvili. I'm the founder of Tabula, Tabula Media. Uh, and right now I'm the director of Voter Education Society. Uh, well, thank you for a very interesting conversation. Uh, but listening to it, I had a feeling that I'm living in kind of a post-truth era where is, there is no right and wrong and where Russia can be equated with the United States. Well, I don't know what are the experiences experiences of dear speaker, what is, what is the experience of dear speaker, but for us like uh, living, uh, uh, who were born in the Soviet Union and who live under like uh, Russian occupation, this is just not right. And from our perspective, equating them is what enables Russia because this is what Russia propaganda is based on, that everyone is the same shit and I, was, I will use this word because Peter has just open the floor and I'm gladly taking it but I mean this is uh, making such equations is exactly what enables bad guys we're never gonna be able to beat bad guys we don't differentiate I'm very angry at Americans time to time and this is the phase when I'm very angry at them but equating them with Russia is enabling Putin this is my point and correct me if I'm wrong There you go, Sat. Yeah. Good, good question. So, for example, when the Americans invaded um, Afghanistan, uh, their presence in Afghanistan enabled us to go back um, and to set up a media business, to create these institutions. And they were on the side of the right until we discovered that whole communities were being targeted. People felt their religion and their way of life uh, was being undermined. Uh, hundreds of people were arrested, thousands killed, um, people sent to Guantanamo, to Bagram Air Base. So it's never that black and white. Even with something we saw in Afghanistan, on Ukraine, I'm not going to comment, obviously. And I'm not saying, uh, obviously, what the Russians have done is, is and uh, as, a, uh, as someone who suffered under the Soviet occupation, I, I'm, I think I'm qualified to say that. But in terms of the American presence in Afghanistan, even the American presence in Afghanistan, which we supported, we thought was good for, for the people of Afghanistan overall, wasn't that black and white. Uh, it's never that black and white. Uh, on the Ukraine, on Ukraine, I'll let the experts discuss this, but, and they're never always bad guys and good guys. Not in the real world. Good guys can do bad things and bad guys can do good things. As we're seeing with the Taliban doing, some of them doing good things, and with the Americans and their supporters and the previous Afghan government, who are the good guys doing a lot of bad things. And it was those bad things that allowed the Taliban to return in the, you know, uh, in the first place. So, um, I see your point, but I don't entirely agree with you. Anyone else? Any other questions? Let's see, I can see a lady just there, three rows back. There we go. 
Sorry, um, Ptolemy Dia was instrumental in uh, changing how women existed in Afghanistan. How do you see that developing under this new, slightly scarier time? You know, um, the world sees Afghanistan as a failure, but I always say, what if it wasn't a failure? What, what if it was a success? The 20 years where the international community pumped money into the country tran was transformative for the people of the country. Um, literacy rates were at 20%. Uh, now it's more than doubled. But if you look at the younger generation of Afghans, the under 30s, something like 75% of them are literate. Um, urbanization, life expectancy, on every benchmark you look at the country, the most, perhaps the most backward country on the planet, has been tra was transformed and has been transformed. And today, the people challenging the Taliban, these young civil society members, the women, the, 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 the young men, they are the byproduct of that transformation. Uh, so I think Afghanistan has changed forever. It's interesting that an Iranian friend of mine said to me the other day, he said, you know, he said, it's funny because women started protesting in Afghanistan first, weeks before uh, we're seeing the protests in Iran. I'm not sure if they're co connected. But, but Afghan women have been protesting in, in front of the Iranian embassy in support of Iranian women uh, in Kabul. So uh, Iranians were always much better educated than the Afghan population, but the Afghans are catching up. And Afghanistan is the youngest country outside of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, median age of 18, population growth rate of 3%. It's going to go from 40 million people to about 100 million people by 2060, 2070, if this continues. So um, it's, it's, it, Afghan women are now championing the cause of all Afghans. The lady there, because uh, you, you were first, just the lady wearing black here, if we could get her a microphone. Okay. Uh, I'm a Russian sociologist, and so I have a sociological question, though I know that it is difficult to answer. How would you estimate the proportion of population who considered uh, U.S. to leave the country as betrayal and f uh, uh, across those who considered to be liberation? Uh, what percentage wanted the, the Americans to leave Afghanistan? You know, I, th I think they, their contribution to the economy was so, uh, so huge. I mean, something like 80 percent. Of, uh, of our income came, came from the international community. So I think a lot of people are cognizant of that, and I think a lot of people didn't want the Americans necessarily to leave. It had fallen dramatically. I think it would have been in the 30 or 40 percent of people wanted the Americans to stay. Um, but the Taliban's support, I mean, this is the interesting statistic, the Taliban's approval rating was about 10 percent, and the government's approval rating was around 15 percent. So mm -hmm. Afghans were dealing two, with two very unpopular uh, alternatives. I think also probably you should add to that, there's also the, the urban-rural divide because in, in the urban areas there was, there was much more support for the Americans staying but also because in the rural areas, especially in the south and the east, that's where the war was most fierce and that's where the people, Afghans, suffered most from American bombing, American raids and so on. That's and correct, so they, yeah. were, they were much more against it and, and, and the problem of course they a lot of the time they never saw each other so the people in the cities didn't really have enough of a concept of what life was like for the people in in southern or eastern afghanistan did they that's correct yeah yeah um i think we had some more questions so let's uh you know what just yes over there there you go have a microphone right next to you there thank you, you. <laughs> um, please uh, identify yourself. Yeah, sorry, it's, I've, I've spoken before, but my name's Frankie and I'm from Coda Story. Um, and I'm a plant by Natalia. Um, <laughs> you speak about uh, this idea that these conflicts kind of become sideshows to these like, major superpower conflicts. But within a lot of these conflicts, there are groups that become like so submerged and so ignored within that. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, within the context of Syria, you've got the Yazidis, in Myanmar, you've got um, the Rohingya. In Afghanistan, there's a big danger at the moment, a big threat that um, a genocide could be committed against the Hazaras. How, how, as an international community, or like kind of from the outside, can we ensure like, or implement mechanisms to protect groups like that? In, in a place where we can't even kind of like um, help or like aid the general population. 
Well, that's why you have, it's important for people like us to remain present so we can document what's transpiring in the country. Uh, genocide is a very sensitive issue right now in Afghanistan, that, you know, the exact UN def definition of genocide may not apply to what's transpiring in Afghanistan yet. Because it's targeted killings, it's mass killings of, of minority groups. Um, uh, but we're not, I don't think we're quite there yet, if, if, if you look at the UN definition. But I think the problem is that when, you know, if you look at what's happening today between the Tajiks and the Kyrgyz, the Armenians and the uh, Azerbaijanis, um, uh, the Russians pulling troops out of Tajikistan because they need them in, in Ukraine, you know, the, the Ukrainian war, uh, you know, its consequences are that people are going to feel emboldened to do, to do more than they would have otherwise. And similarly, with the Americans leaving a vacuum in, you know, in the Middle East and so forth, it will also embolden other countries to do other things. Um, so I think that's why I think we're, we're sort of entering a pretty dangerous phase where anything could go. And I think this is why my concern is, I mean, the Cold War things were pretty steady. Everyone knew their place, there were back channels, people were communicating. Once in a while there was an invasion, whether it was Hungary or Afghanistan or Czechoslovakia, but it was business as usual most of the time. But now there's this element of, of unpredictability, uh, both from the sort of superpowers as well as uh, local countries in terms of their regional issues and, and conflicts. Mm -hmm. We've got time just for a couple more questions. Uh, so just any, any more before we... Oh. Actually, no, I'm, being, I'm getting different messages here, talking about uh, different stories. Um, I'm from one side here, I'm being told we should wind up, but actually over from the other side, I got another story entirely. I was told we had 10 more minutes. So, <laughs> so I saw a hand go up, I saw a hand go up over there. There we go, yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, so, uh, thank you for uh, the, this conversation. Uh, you, uh, you said that world, uh, we should not see the world in just black and white colors in which I totally agree but also does not that exactly mean that equation of Russia and the USA is wrong based I, I, I just lost you on this uh, logic and another uh, question I have is that you also mentioned uh, uh, that bad guys occasionally do good things and good guys do bad things and in that I also of course agree but you also said that Taliban's time to time may uh, do good things and I'm just interested is that was it just uh, figure of speech or there really is anything Taliban's are doing good it's just it would be a very interesting case maybe we're misinformed what Taliban have done good thank you Okay, on, on black and white, I think, I, you know, I have my own black and whites, but they may be very different to someone else's black and whites. So the way we see things may differ, and, you know, and that's what I'm saying, that there are shades of gray, that people will perceive things very differently, depending on the situation. In terms of the Taliban, the good things, uh, they're less corrupt, uh, they're uh, collecting revenues uh, pretty religiously with a lot of discipline. Secure, there's a lot of security. You know, we were losing, uh, you know, 20, 200, 300 individuals a day because of the fighting. We're not seeing that today. We're seeing ISIS-type attacks, but they're, you know, once every two, three days and 20 people die. That's a, still a lot of people. But we're not seeing the numbers we were seeing before. So that, that's interesting. So the civil war has ended for now. I mean, it could start again. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, th those two things stand out in terms of some of the positive things. They seem to be a lot more um, engaged with the public. They actually believe they're of the people, for the people. Whereas the previous government, they were more concerned about going to Washington or Brussels or London to give speeches. They were less concerned about uh, feeling accountable to the Afghan population. You know, you talk about this, uh, I discussed the frontier state or client state mentality. That's what we had with the previous government. But that's not to say the Taliban are not doing bad things. They're repressing people, they're repressing our women. They have a very dogmatic, uh, medieval uh, uh, view of Islam. Um, they're taking us back, but, but the population is resisting. Saad, thank you very much. And uh, if, if there's a message, it feels to me that we should take away from this is to keep thinking about stories and how we tell them. And, I think hopefully one of the things that comes out of this is that we do need to look at 
conflicts, past conflicts, in a different way and to realize that there are many different ways of seeing them. And I think that also, though, especially applies to the way that Russia's involvement in past conflicts has also been seen. And I think we've been hearing some of that kind of conversation coming through uh, today. But Saad, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, great, to, great to see you here. Thank you, everybody.